Awesome. Uh, yeah, so it's just kind of a freewheeling discussion, I guess. Um, I, I did a panel last year at Xworld, and it was a lot of fun. It was just a great way to kind of get the speakers that we saw all throughout the day, uh, a chance to kind of riff on some of the, the things that they discussed themselves and, and to get some feedback throughout uh, the presentation from other speakers. So it really worked last year, it really worked well last year. I remember when Tony originally asked uh, last year for the panel and it was a panel about as big as this one, I thought he was absolutely insane because this is quite a few people and not that many mics, but it, it did actually turn out very, very well. Okay. Um, so hopefully it will work just as well uh, today. Now I'm starting with Eric, who is uh, taking photos of the audience right now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, <laughs> if everyone can bunch up. Um, but Eric, um, as as a person who used to be a trainer, first of all, I've got to say it's fantastic to be on stage with you. I'm a bit of a fanboy after all of these years. So oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it really is fantastic to keep be. keep it up, and I won't be able to walk out the door. My head will be too big. <laughs> But no, I really, really enjoyed uh, your discussion, and thank God I took notes, because it's been a very long day. Um, so, let me just start with you. Um, I, liked, I liked the idea of the, the figure out and share, and I've been very, very big on that myself, mainly because I don't really know a lot, and so I, I look to the very smart people that are in this room to kind of get me through my day, every day. If you're on the Slack channel, I'm the person who's asking the really, really easy questions, um, so I do thank everyone who's in that channel who answers them, uh, and the, the couple of people who are, uh, who could be rude and aren't when, when I ask something really, really basic. So, um, you know, why, why does the Mac community have such a, um, why do you think the Mac community has such a fantastic uh, kind of, I don't know, all in this together kind of mentality? I don't see that elsewhere. That's a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, why does the Mac Apple admin community have more empathy for each other than other communities? I, I don't know. Does anyone want to take a stab? I'll take a stab at that. So um, I've been doing this since uh, Apple was beleaguered uh, 100 years ago. And um, it, you took all the help you could get, but you also gave any help you could, because uh, if you actually found somebody in an airport using a power book, you had that moment of, hey, I know you, let's be buds. <laughs> and so uh, there was like a camaraderie born of, of um, just the challenge of using the platform when nobody wanted you to use the platform. So I think that is a, 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 at least a component of it. We were a minority. <laughs> and as such, we banded together. That's basically it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that sounds about right. There, there, there does seem to be the kind of, you can see the battle scars of people who were using the Mac like pre-iPhone to the people who have come later, which is no, you know, obviously we love everyone. But yeah, and jump onto a Linux forum and ask a question one day, just for, for comparison. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, we, we saw a lot of um, new, uh, new software features, not a lot of shiny things this, this year at WWDC. I was just wondering if I can get, um, uh, an idea from the panel of, of kind of what you're excited for and I know again Eric you mentioned um, some of the changes that you could see by reading the tea leaves of some of the things that we saw on WWDC. Well so I, I had up there the blog post about seeing iOS apps on Mac um, makes you think about well does this mean that there could be more platform changes uh, chip changes for for Mac, um, and you know I, I have to believe that there's that Apple's always trying a billion things that they don't ever see the light of day, and they decide no, we're not going to do it this way. Um, but uh, you know we've already saw a transition from PowerPC to Intel, um, and you know that was that was a little awkward at, at for for some things, um, but for the most part people. You know, users of, of the Mac didn't really care what kind of engine their Mac had. Um, it just, they, they just used their Mac. They don't really, just like I don't know what kind of spark plug gap I have in the car that I drive. It's just, it just gets me from one place to another. It's just a tool. Um, 
yeah, that's that's all I'll say for that. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? Uh, anything? Call um, the coolest thing for me that came out of WWDC this year was VPP for Apple TV. Um, I'm a big Apple TV fan, love managing them, they're awesome. But um, yeah, VPP's a big turning point there. On that, we didn't actually get to see what I was hoping we would see, which is a more Apple TV-like experience for Macs in labs. Um, the fact that we still have to hit three buttons at the start of a lab refresh uh, on 700 machines in my location um, is something that's kind of frustrating. Uh, does, uh, do, do we think we're finally going to see that one day? Anyone? <laughs> the Eurace OS install command is sort of a, a bit of a writing on the wall scenario for mm, that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's there's been a, ba a lot of backlash about the, the fact that you can't image and you need to install. Like, I mean, I fervently believe that and have done for years, and I hate imaging. Um, but the the whole concept of the erase all content and settings and then just bounce it back to ground zero, that's that's coming. Um, and it'll come into the OS mainstream sooner or later. Like, I mean, that's a long, straight, flat road with a big, shiny light. <laughs> Fair enough. So you're feeling confident then, Mark? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you are? OK, good. Because, yes, I was, I was just hoping we'd get maybe something a little bit a little bit more than we saw in terms of like skipping those first three steps. Yeah, it'd be wonderful, but it hasn't happened yet. But there's there's a lot of stuff that happens midstream through the OS releases. And that, it's true. Yeah, um, like I mean, we saw APFS introduced prior to a major release of the OS. There's no reason why, and Apple do listen. If you make enough noise and enough people make that noise, yep. they do take that on board and, and work with it. I'm going to put on my reminiscence hat. Does anyone remember the auto server setup folder? Oh, yeah. So you could, uh, you could have a, a bunch of settings in a folder called auto space server space setup uh, and put it on a little USB drive, uh, connect it to a fresh out of the box Mac, turn it on, and um, it would use those settings to set up the server with those settings. So if you had a rack full of X serves, um, you, they could automatically configure themselves. Uh, so I did hundreds, possibly thousands of exos like that. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, I can see something like that, um, but I don't know that I have much confidence that Apple is uh, focusing on Mac Labs. Mm. Uh, it seems like the focus is on individuals' uh, computers, and well, individuals' why, devices. Why would they want you to share a device when they can sell more devices by having everybody have their own? At Mac Sysadmin, Kevin White said, you know, do you really think that when people were asking uh, a panel about, you know, multiple users of, of iOS, and Kevin White said, do you think that there's any possible alternate dimension reality in which Apple is going to give you a way of buying less devices? No, that's never going to happen. And it happened. <laughs> With iOS 9.3, shared iPad. Yeah. And I've got to say, uh, so when I did uh, press someone at WWDC about the fact that those three screens are still there at the startup process. Um, they said that the startup process is not finalized, that what we're seeing now in Mojave is not what will be the final thing, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, what, what will be the final mojo. thing that we see. I believe the correct term is mojo. <laughs> mojo, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'd assume maybe someone, one person on this stage might know something more, but I won't ask in terms of, just in case. No? no anyway. Um, <laughs> Fair enough then. Ed, um, you talked about uh, empathy with your users and it's something that um, I've really kind of tried to bring to the locations that I've worked at. Um, I, I, I'm curious actually, who gives uh, admin rights to their end users in their locations? Yeah? And, and yeah, from the audience? Excellent. Uh, can someone take a photo of that? Actually, yeah. everyone <laughs> do that. Uh, it works in a regulated market. What was that? It works in a regulated market. Yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. I, I was surprised. I changed jobs uh, recently, and I was surprised 
uh, that, yeah, none of our users have admin rights, and it's something that um, I would love to introduce. If, if I was to do that, how, how would I sell that um, to the people who are worried? Intr introducing the rights or taking them away? Uh, introducing admin rights to our end users. I'll just do it, no one will notice. <laughs> and things, things will just get better for your end users and no one will notice. No, I, I mean, again, I think that goes back to the threat model. What are you protecting against? What, what, what are the people worried about yeah. giving admin rights? You know, um, I, I think, um, you know, you look at iOS devices and they're controlled by an end user and you don't think about admin rights on an iOS device. It's like you just have full run of the whole thing. Um, and I think that model can be and will be applied more and more to the Mac as Apple gets better at locking down the system and making root not a sort of special thing. Um, but if, you, if there's a good case against it, against people having admin rights, then all right, maybe that's just the world you live in and you deal with it. But mm. if there's no threat that you can figure out that you know why 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 are we taking this away from people you know then that's your case like don't do it it, <laughs> it is the default behavior of the os and yeah. apple encourages it and recommends it and basically not doing it is kind of fighting the machine so there has to be a good reason yeah. just go with the flow you know, like it's it's much easier to run with it than resist it yeah um, we're trying to follow the australian government's best practice and their, well, their, their number three thing for security things is to not give your end users admin rights. And we've actually seen across our industry where we're sort of semi-academia, um, semi-not-for-profit, that a lot of institutes are starting to take them away, which surprised me because I thought the other way would be happening more. Mm. Um, but certainly one of our sort of sister organisations took it away recently and they said, well, we've got Jamp self-service, we've got equivalent on Windows. Um, why do people need admin rights? What are they doing that they can't do through these processes? Uh, providing you can give people an environment that works for them, is, is there a point? And secondly, we're, we're Mac and Windows. You know, giving people admin rights on, on a Mac might be fine, but mm -hmm. we kind of need one unified policy and nobody wants to give users admin rights on Windows in general. So, um, yeah, it's a slightly different take, but it, mm. it, it, we don't... It doesn't really ha come up very often when somebody new starts and they say, well, if I've got admin rights, we say no. It's generally the end of it. We don't hear consistent complaints because they have everything they need. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I have something to add that. Um, so there is also a difference between admin rights and imposing restrictions. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Um, or the reduction of admin rights and re imposing restrictions. So if you take away admin rights, someone doesn't have the ability to set certain things, but you're not restricting them from running software or generally using the device. Because, I mean, I've had some horrific Windows environments working in them where you aren't allowed to run something like a command prompt. And someone at help desk asks you to do a ping test, and you just sit there and go, well, how? Hmm. <laughs> like, seriously, how? But the, you know, like, I, I believe that everyone should have admin rights because it's a default behavior, but if you are in a, like a controlled market or something like that, um, then taking them away, but finding the balance when you do it, not going over the top, not crippling their experience is the way to approach it. Um, you know, take them away one at a time. Yeah, I mean, I can agree with the stance of um, taking away admin rights, but if it doesn't actually impact anyone and they can do their jobs, hey, great, that's that's fine. But I think you know, you said um, part of that came from you know government advice, and I think there certainly was a point in time, particularly on the Windows platform, where it was important to not run as an admin, and that was really good security advice. But that's one of those things that's just become like this long time myth of like, well, you want to be secure or take away admin rights. Yeah, it's just become this cargo cult behavior of like, we're just going to keep doing that uh, along with, you know, make sure people change their passwords every month. Like that has become sort of outdated advice, but there are so many companies that still like, well, you're going to change your password every month or six weeks or whatever. And it's just kind of nonsense. So fair enough. And I'm um, sticking with you for a second, Ed. Um, so on Friday, I was very proud of myself because I finally got auto package to work. 
And then <laughs> you told me that it's dangerous and I should run away. So <laughs> what? I'm very sad now. What, what, what can no, I do? It, no, no, no. Let me let me clear that up right away. I don't want to say that auto package is dangerous or that it's a, you know, it's a problem. But um, auto package depends on recipes, as they're called in yep. auto package language. Um, and to run a recipe, typically you're going out to GitHub, fetching this recipe, and it clones it down to your machine and runs all the commands that are in that. And well, that could be anything, mm -hmm. right? And, and again, like I trust the Mac community, but um, me personally, I would like to bring those recipes down, look at them, make sure I know what they're doing, run them locally, and when there are updates to them, you know, do a git diff against what's up there and make sure I agree with those changes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't want to say auto package is a bad thing at all, but just from a security perspective, depending, again, depending on your threat model and kind of your level of paranoia with it, I like inspecting things before I just blindly run them. And yeah. auto package could be one of those things, like every time you run it, it's checking those recipes and uh, fetching new ones. Well, do you know the, you know, do you know what's changed between each time you fetch that recipe? Mm. Well, I am super paranoid, but I am also super lazy, so yeah. I'm, I'm in a bind. Um, and, and I guess, is there, are there open source tools out there that can kind of do some of that stuff for me, like to, to make sure that what, what is supposed to be Office is Office or whatever? Uh, no, but I think, you know, it'd be, again, pretty easy to write. Uh, you know, in Duncan's session, he was talking about source control and yep. uh, GitLab, when you mentioned GitLab, the cool thing about GitLab versus GitHub is you can host your own GitLab if you want. You can put that up on That's you know, Compute Engine or AWS or whatever. Um, so what you could do certainly is clone things to your own local source repo, mm -hmm. um, fetch them from there, and then when you sync back up to master, you can diff whatever comes in and just you know, by your yeah. eye, it's like, the, the See what's changed. The basic premise, though, is effectively don't blindly trust something that you get from the yep. internet. <clears throat> and, like, I, I don't even blindly trust stuff I've written myself. Because <laughs> uh, I can't remember what I was doing that day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's that's a blur. That's a level of paranoia, man. Sorry? <laughs> that's a level of paranoia. No, that's just yeah. a level of forgetfulness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so even just inspecting, like, inspect all code before you run it. If you didn't write it yourself, even if you wrote it yourself more than about three months ago, probably have a look at it. See what it's doing, step through yeah. it, check it yeah, all yeah. out. Um, that's just good the, practice. Oh, I unbundle the, the packages that get created, oh, but, yeah. but you're saying that I should be inspecting the, the recipes themselves yeah. as well? The recipe does an execution. Yeah, yeah execution. okay. Oh, yeah. God, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it, could be, it could be, but I mean, like, that's why that's a valid question. Like, how do you automate something like this? And, you know, if I was pressing auto package into service, I would definitely be looking at automating the reporting of what has changed in a recipe, yeah. There is actually a very good uh, YouTube uh, presentation from I think the Penn State Mac admins uh, from last year talking about kind of, uh, I think uh, you clone the recipes and then change whatever you want to change and then you're fetching on your own recipe mm -hmm. as well. So there are things like that that you can do to kind of hopefully stop any, any recipes changing without your knowledge and, and getting you in trouble. Is I haven't done any of that did? yet. Sorry? Is that what you did? No, no, no. <laughs> you, you will see tomorrow that all of this is way above my head. Um, <laughs> Gotta start somewhere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, uh, well, I guess one of the reasons I am using uh, Auto Package is uh, patch management is good, um, but I, I think there is room for improvement there. Um, are we going to see some more features added into patch management with Jam? Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. Are, are there any other tools people are using outside of Auto Package? I know, Duncan, you um, have spun up something yourself. Oh, we have our own tools, but uh, just on the patch management thing, um, for anyone who was in my session, they saw the last five minutes, so big deal. Otherwise, uh, Kenobi.io, and that's K-I-N-O-B-I. 
um, to I/O, and that is actually just an API endpoint for Jamf patch with uh, an interface editor for the JSON. Um, so it's very easy to use. It kind of guides you and it sanity checks you, and hopefully we've we've got that much error checking in there that it, you can't actually screw up a definition. Um, that's the idea. Excellent, excellent. Uh, John, you mentioned that you moved from uh, Monkey uh, to Jamf over the last year. Um, I, I really did want to find out kind of what, what would be the one thing you would love to take from either, uh, what would be the one thing from Monkey you would love to see in Jamf and vice versa? Oh, where to start? Um, it's, I think if I'd never used Monkey, um, I'd feel slightly differently, but it, Monkey, understands the package that you're adding to it, whereas in general, Jamf has no concept of what you're adding. It knows that there's a package, but it doesn't know what's in it. And so it's really the, the, um, the way that Monkey inspects it and deals with it. So updates are just so simple. It's just put the latest version on rather than, I mean, we, we use Auto Packager with, with Jamf and uh, using the JSS importer. A new package comes along and it has to update both the, the, the policy and the smart group and it, it, it's a bit more long-winded and I think that's why people are looking at stuff like uh, Jamjar to mm. hopefully automate some of that but yeah just that sort of strange disconnect I think is, is um, one of the, the big things that I miss about Monkey. Uh, yeah. uh, d is anyone running Jamjar in this room? Does anyone know what Jamjar is? It's kind of like a combination of Jamf and Monkey. Uh, run side by side and apparently using the best tools of both. Um, but yeah, the end point is basically Jamf to, to push out everything. Is that the thing that was formerly called Junkie? <laughs> I don't know, but I would understand the uh, name change if it was. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just get, do you know who the author was? I'm uh, not sure, not sure. Oh, uh, Jam Jar? It, Jam Jar, yeah. Doesn't that come from Ben Toms? Yeah. Yep. Uh, is okay. that correct? Yeah. Then, no, it's not formally junky. Yes, fair enough then. Uh, so, Duncan, I missed your talk, unfortunately. Um, so, can you give me a bit of a rundown of what it was? It, and does anyone have any questions for... Uh, you always scare me when you open your mouth. Um, I can never keep up. So, uh, does anyone have any questions or can explain what Duncan says one, once he finishes talking? Go. So, me, no, it was, it was basically about applying development principles to being a sysadmin and using that to make sure that you have things like version control and support and nice UIs and all of that other shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you want someone to explain that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that, I got that one, actually. Mm. <laughs> that was fine. That was fine. Um, if nothing, I'm succinct. Yes, you are. You are. Fair enough. Uh, well, actually, just going back to uh, WWDC, this new Apple that kind of like tells us what they're doing before they do it, is, is quite a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, what, what do you think is changing there? Like, what, what is happening at, uh, at the spaceship to, to change this, this way of dealing with um, its end users? Anyone? Do we have an official Apple marketing response? I don't think there's any official Apple people in the room, so feel free to. It's good. <laughs> it's good? It's yeah. Good. So, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. Yep. Oh, well, I was going to say it's good, but. I think there's been a little disconnect because we've in the past gotten so used to Apple announcing something and saying, and you can go get it today. Mm -hmm. And now there have been these little like um, uh, operational lags and Apple says, hey, we're doing this thing. And it's like, wow, it's vaporware. Like, you know, they announced the air uh, charging pad. What's it called? Air power or whatever it is. And it's like, where is it? It just announced over a year ago, and it just has never shown up, and that's weird. And then uh, the the HomePod thing, mm -hmm. like there were so many delays in that. And hey, it happens, but this is Apple, right? Like their their operational stuff used to be so top notch, and it's odd when there have been these delays. So I think it's just, again, going back to, you know, we've had the battle scars from, from Apple long ago, and <laughs> Apple was always on the top of their game then. Uh, and I suppose you have an expectation when you're given a heads up, you kind of think something's coming, but if they just dump it on you, then it's okay. Then it's beautiful, yes, yeah. nice surprise. <laughs> so, um, but as far as what's going on, I think, um, you know, Apple, knows that there's still growth to be had, uh, particularly in enterprises. Um, you know, they've been 
consumer focused for a very long time and they're trying to do this uh, hey, let's get into more enterprises. Yeah. And enterprises want to know what's coming and they want to know, um, they typically want to know a very like specific roadmap. And Apple's probably never going to give that out. Um, Apple does give out a roadmap at WDC, kind mm -hmm. of. Like, you know, you have to read the tea leaves a little bit, but you can see what's coming. Yep. Um, but they have gotten a little bit more open with what they're willing to tell people. And I think that's only because enterprises are forcing them to. And yeah. Apple realizes if they want to get into the enterprise, that's what they're going to have to do. Yeah, makes sense. It's a good, it's, it's a good thing because I'm sick of having conversations with um, people at work about how uh, mobile accounts are not the way to go, <laughs> yeah. not the way of the future, um, and not really having much to point to them to sort of confirm that, yeah, we should do local accounts instead of network accounts. And so I think it's good news for us. Mm -hmm. Actually, show of hands, who is using mobile accounts? Oh, it's smaller than... And High Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, my condolences. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I've, I've well, who is enjoying me. using mobile accounts in Vice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nothing. Fair, fair enough. Um, actually, it was, uh, on the, that topic of mobile accounts, and um, I mean, everything seems to change all the time uh, in, this, in this world, which is kind of what makes it fun and interesting, I think. Um, but yeah, who, who is using any tools uh, like um, moving away from AD and using any of those new shiny tools that we're, we're starting to see? Um, uh, is it Nomad, things like that? Uh, are any locations here represented? We're, we're sort of piloting it at the moment and running it alongside. Um, we've certainly had a few issues with AD with uh, 1013 and uh, mm -hmm. file shares in particular, and so looking at Nomad to do that and Likewise, uh, quite excited about the sort of new login window, Nomad as well, would, would be, yeah, <laughs> yeah, quite. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something we're trying, and I think we're just figuring it out at the moment, but it's impressive stuff. Um, we're testing it currently. Um, I find it solves a whole lot of the issues we would have had. I don't have to bind to AD for anything. It's great. Um, our ideal as an organisation would be to have it single sign-on through Azure. Um, yep. And, yeah, that's kind of all we need, really. I've been using Nomad um, in, at Seek, which is where I work. Um, it's, been, it's been great, super reliable, and the support community's fantastic. Like, the Slack channel's really good. Um, and I noticed recently that Microsoft um, provided a like a sign-in helper script just to um, sort of autofill the um, like the UPN value for, for Outlook um, and it had a, a function there that, that checked for the existence of Nomad which I thought was really cool so it's as um, that they're kind of there uh, accepting that Nomad is, is a tool that's that's out there and they're utilizing it um, you know Efficient. What a world we live in, yeah. <laughs> Even Microsoft themselves are moving away from directory binding for user endpoints, so. Yeah, there you go. Um, can I ask uh, Lucy about uh, Google and, and some of the, uh, uh, not to kind of step on your, your presentation tomorrow too early, but um, yeah, what, what are the, some of the uh, uh, issues you face at, with such a massive fleet? Um, Clay will probably uh, touch upon this more tomorrow, but one of the biggest issues I would say is just trying to cover all of our bases with everything, all of the support that we do. Um, I'm just an IT resident. Um, I'm not a Mac admin like you all. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of what I see is just trying to like cover everything that we do and just make our users as happy as possible, and then like kind of debug later on <laughs> <laughs> as you go along, but yeah. I, can, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to have uh, Google engineers as, as customers of a support. It's terrifying. It would be, it would be. <laughs> I mean, academics are pretty good at arguing, um, but yeah. Engineer. Somehow you're a specialist, but they, they know more than you for some reason. It's, it's an awesome, like, 
little field to be in. Yeah. 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 And you were saying uh, last night that there was it was such a fascinating um, experience going from an admin to an end user. Um, can you go into that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, I mean, not that much to go into, but I guess, you know, for me, the roles have flipped a little bit going from being an admin um, and sort of being the one to set the vision and impose things on end users um, to starting a new job, getting handed a Mac, and it's sort of already configured for me, and it's like, yeah, just log in, and there's all this crap on the machine already, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm the one sort of now, like, filing help tickets and going, why the hell is this like this, you know, or like, why can't I do this thing that I want to do? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's been a little interesting, but, um, you know, uh, in, in my presentation, I asked for us as administrators and people in charge of the technology to have empathy for end users, you know, before I complain now, at least I have some empathy for them. It's like, yeah, all right, I, I know why they're doing this. <laughs> you know, like, I can't complain too much because I was just the one doing that to people. So, like, all right, I get it, you know. Yeah. Sorry, were you going to? No? OK. Um, and I guess one of the, the big, uh, one of the big things we still haven't gotten right in tech um, is, uh, kind of diversity in, in the people that we see uh, around us in the office and also diversity in the people that we see up on stage at conferences like this. I think this conference is doing very, very well, um, considering. Um, but yeah, is there, is there anything that you could uh, uh, say in terms of, um, yeah, I don't know, getting, getting more, uh, a more diverse workforce in IT specifically? Anyone want to comment on that? Um. No, you go, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a stalemate for a little while. No, no, you go. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, as a woman coming to conferences like this, it can be quite intimidating. I think last year there were only three women here, actually. So it's awesome seeing so many more this year. Um, it's, it's kind of like you walk into a room and, and it's like you're an alien or something. Everyone just looks at you and they don't mean to, you're just different and, and that's life. But um, the cool thing about the Mac admin community is they just treat you like another Mac admin. And um, yeah, if, if anyone's thinking of coming along but sort of put off by, oh, it's a, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman and I'm not going to fit in. Don't worry about that because it's so welcoming and such a comfortable environment to be in. Yeah, being a woman in tech is interesting, especially in IT. We're very uncommon, and I got my degree in CS, so I was one of the only women in the class. Um, and it's especially terrifying, like, speaking at these events and speaking at um, meetings, just like having that um, spotlight on you when you know that you're different in the room. Yeah. And having to earn that respect instead of it given to you right when you walk into the room. It's definitely, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> um, I also think that um, it's taken me a few years to realise that I may not um, act and think like the typical Apple geek fanboy. Like, I just felt that, OK, maybe that means that I, I don't really belong to the community because I don't, I don't really geek out about the hardware very much. Like, I'm just, it's... Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's, t it's taken me a little while, but I think that um, conferences that, uh, uh, thanks to Tony's um, help with, like, DevWorld and, um, and XWorld have really made a difference because seeing someone that looks like you and possibly um, thinks like you and, and, and seeing them out there doing the stuff that you want to be doing makes a, a, a huge difference. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, not to be the, the white guy talking about this, these things, um, but I am for a second. <laughs> um, I, I, I do think if you do want to kind of um, understand some of the issues a little bit better, um, Try to read as many uh, blogs and uh, follow as many uh, uh, women on Twitter as you can that are in this field. And also, like uh, you know, I think uh, Kara Swisher is one of the best voices in technology, no matter what. Um, so listen to her, and, and you'll just just it, it'll start. You'll start to notice if you pay attention all of the little 
things that go, like all the little kind of, dis discrimination is the too strong a word, I guess, but the, the way that um, the default is always kind of pres presumed to be a man um, in, in much of the discussion that you hear in, in other places. So I don't know, that's my, my two cents on the topic. Also, if you not noticed during um, Ed's presentation, all those photos that came up on Google Photos were all men. So. Well, the hoodie ones, we don't know. <laughs> the hoodie ones were, were covered up. <laughs> Masculine hands. But I agree. I agree I, I agree. I thought about that. But yeah. yeah, we, yeah. Don't, we don't know with the hoodies, but with the security ones, it was all men in suits. Yeah, I definitely noticed that. Yeah. I, I swear, if they all wore hoodies, it would be so much easier to do your job. Like, it, you just spot the guy in the hoodie. That would... Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. that's not the case. <laughs> I will say that... Um, He's here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> hacker, hacker. Um, hacker man. I, I mean, uh, back on the diversity topic, I, I have been really lucky to work with some amazing women uh, in tech, and uh, I, I think I've been you know, really lucky with that. And I'll, I'll have to say that at Duo, the security team is, I think, evenly split. So that's been really great to see. Yeah. Excellent. Um, is there any way I can, I'm, I'm a nobody in my job, but is there any way, I, like, how can I bring this up to my boss? Does anyone know? Does anyone have good feedback? Do you have one-on-ones with your boss? I do, I do. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe that's you, the time. You could ask your boss, is, is your boss a man? Of course. You could ask him what it's like to be a man in IT. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because no one has ever asked me, what, Eric, what's it like to be a man in that is the IT field? Actually, yeah, another Twitter account to follow, the man who has it all. Brilliant. Yes, yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah, follow it. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, is there anything else uh, anyone wanted to bring up? Any, anything that you heard from another speaker today uh, that you were really interested in and wanted to ask questions specifically to them? Be the audience for a second. Give some feedback. No? No? <laughs> I guess not. Fair enough. Well, um, I think we might wrap it, up, wrap it up there. We are a little bit early, but that has been the case for most of the day. Um, I want to thank everyone on the panel here today for joining us, and thanks everyone here. <laughs>
same sort of thing as this, same kind of structure. I'd love to get this event to a, a dual stream event if we can as well. Um, we've, we're getting more and more content every year. Um, we see that just by having to run a second stream for one block this afternoon. And I would like to see us getting to that point. So if you are um, thinking about submitting something, here's a tip, don't submit one thing, submit two or three, because that helps us build themes and build, um, build an event that sort of fits together even better. So that doesn't mean we'll accept all three. Often that's not the point of asking you to submit three. It helps us you know, build a, a, a more structured event. But sometimes we do say, we do like the, to these two talks that you've offered and we would love to accept both of them. Are you open to that? Um, and if you're traveling, um, we'll offer, usually offer more speaker support to help get you here if you do agree to do two talks. So that's always worth bearing in mind as well. I'm sorry, I've hijacked your... I, I was just going to say, don't just, don't just think of talks you'd like to do, your, do yourself. If, if there's a voice you think you would like to see up on stage, either let that voice know that you'd like to see them at the conference or let us know that there's a voice you'd like to see at the conference that you think people would like to hear. So that's a really good way to in increase the diversity is to highlight where there isn't diversity and point towards opportunities for, for rectifying that. And related to that, We've had this lovely idea for two years, which in theory sounds fantastic, and everyone says, that's great, but it hasn't worked out in practice to be much good, and that is we have a suggestions board on the XWorld site where you can propose a talk that you would like to see, and then we can hopefully find someone who can offer that talk. Now, it's not always going to hap happen. Everyone uniformly says, that's great, what a, what a fantastic idea. But when it comes to getting people to even submit a suggestion for someone else's talk, you don't do it. <laughs> and that's what we need. We just, we just, you know, there's lots and lots of talented people, and I would just love to go and approach them and say, how about you talk on this topic? Because a lot of people, you invite them to talk, and they're happy to talk. Most people just think, oh, no, no one wants to hear what I'm, I'm working on. You know, they're experts, I'm nothing. Um, you'd be surprised. You'd really be surprised. And, and another thing, I guess, is the, the Mac admins groups that are, Mac admin meetups that are in Sydney and Melbourne, I assume yeah. other cities around uh, Australia as well. Uh, yeah. Head on down to those. They're, they're run by lovely people and Marcus. And um, <laughs> they uh, have, yeah, just it's, really, it's a really great opportunity to get up on stage in front of, or not even a stage, sometimes it's at a pub, so it's way less uh, awkward than being on a stage and staring at a big auditorium like this. It's a good way to kind of, you know, get to know uh, your voice and, and how to talk to, to a larger room of people and, and you know if nothing else then it'll mean if you present something like that at a Mac admins and it goes down well and you get some good feedback or things you might have forgotten to include then it means the next time you have to present it at a meeting or to your boss you'll, you'll smash it. So. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say also with the, the presentations, well I know the ones that I give, I understand that there are going to be people in the audience who know a lot of what I'm talking about. There's going to be people in the audience who know none of what I'm talking about. Um, what you have to remember when you're doing this is just if you can manage to gear it so that everyone takes away just one little thing, which is probably going to be, well, in my case, about eight seconds of a talk, um, if you can just give something back, because there is, there's quite often... Um, you, you're daunted when you're on stage and you can look out in the audience. I remember my first talk in the front row had him in it and uh, <laughs> Joel Rennick in it and, well, Josh Weisenbaker and bloody, oh, it was horrifying. But um, it was Joel who said to me, he said that you're up here for a reason because you know something about this that is actually valuable to everybody else. Like the submitting and getting accepted is already confirmation of that. So it should help you with any nerves and, and things like that. So don't think that what you're doing doesn't have value because quite literally you could be doing something that everybody else overlooks or forgets about. And that's really important to remember. There was a great comment the folks from Penn State made when they were on the podcast that when they review the workshops that they do and people are saying, why do you keep running these same introductory workshops every year um, and they said they're the most well attended workshops because as we saw when we had the raise of hands before not everybody um, has been here year after year there are a lot of people where this is the first time here they're just new to this with um, you know with the increasing exposure to max in the workforce there's a lot of people just starting to do this so you may not be an expert in every field but you may be able to describe something or tell a story that's going to help a lot of people Thank <laughs> you.